Voice of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft. The essential salts of animals may be so prepared and preserved that the ingenious man may have the whole ark of Noah in his study and raise the fine shape of an animal out of its ashes at its pleasure. And by the like method, from the essential salts of humane dust, a philosopher may, without any criminal necromancy, call upon the shape of any dead ancestor, for their dust whereinto his body has been incinerated. Borellus. Volume 1, Chapter 1. A Result in a Prologue. From a private hospital for the insane near Provence, Rhode Island, there recently disappeared an exceedingly singular person. He bore the name of Charles Dexter Ward and was placed under restraint most reluctantly by the grieving father who had watched his aberration grow from a mere eccentricity to a dark mania involving both the possibility of murderous tendencies and a profound and peculiar change in the apparent contents of his mind. Doctors confessed themselves quite baffled by his case, since it presented oddities of a general physiological as well as psychological character. In the first place, the patient seemed oddly older than his twenty-six years would warrant. Mental disturbance, it is true, will age one rapidly, but the face of the young man had taken on a subtle cast which only the very age normally acquire. In the second place, his organic processes showed a certain queerness of proportions which nothing in medical experience can parallel. Respiration and heart action had a baffling lack of symmetry. The voice was lost so that no sounds above a whisper were possible. Digestion was incredibly prolonged and minimized, and neural reactions to standard stimuli bore no relation at all to anything heretofore recorded, either normal or pathological. The skin had a morbid chill and dryness, and the cellular structure of the tissue seemed exaggeratedly coarse and loosely knit. Even a large olive birthmark on the right hip had disappeared. Whisks there had formed on the chest a very peculiar mole or blackish of which no trace existed before. In general, all physicians agreed that in war, the processes of metabolism had become retarded to a degree beyond precedent. Psychologically, too, Charles Ward was unique. His madness held no affinity to any sort recorded in even the latest and most exhausted of treaties, and was conjoined to a mental force which would have made him a genius or a leader had it not been twisted into strange and grotesque forms. Dr. Willett, who was Ward's family physician, affirms that the patient's gross mental capacities, as gauged by his response to manners outside the sphere of his insanity, had actually increased since the seizure. Ward, as it's true, was always a scholar and an antiquarian, but even his most brilliant early work did not show the prodigious grasp and insight displayed during his last examinations by the alienist. It was indeed a difficult manner to obtain a legal commitment to the hospital, so powerful and loose said did the young man's mind seem and only on the evidence of others and on the strength of many abnormal gaps in his stock of information as distinguished from his intelligence was he finally placed in confinement to the very moment of his vanishment he was an omnivorous reader and as great a conversationalist as his poor voice permitted and showed observers failing to foresee his escape freely predicted that he would not be long in gaining his discharge from custody only Dr. Willett, who brought Charles Ward into the world and had watched his growth of body and mind ever since, seemed frightened at the thought of his future freedom. He had had a terrible experience and had made a terrible discovery which he dared not reveal to his skeptical colleagues. Willett, indeed, presents a minor mystery all his own in the connection with the case. He was the last to see the patient before his flight and emerged from that final conversation in a state of mixed horror and relief, which several recalled when Ward's escape came known three hours later. That escape itself is one of the unsolved wonders of Dr. Waite's hospital. A window open above, a sheer drop of sixty feet could hardly explain it. Yet after that talk with Willett, the youth was undeniably gone. Willett himself had no public explanations to offer, 
though he seems strangely easier in mind than before the escape. Many indeed feel that he would like to say more if he thought any considerable number would believe him. He had found Ward in his room, but shortly after his departure, the attendants knocked in vain. When they opened the door, the patient was not there, and all they found was the open window with a chill April breeze blowing in a cloud of fine bluish-gray dust that almost choked them. True, the dogs howled some time before, but that was while Willa was still present, and they had caught nothing and shown no disturbance later on. Ward's father was told at once over the telephone, but he seemed more saddened than surprised. By the time Dr. Waite called in person, Dr. Willett had been talking with him, and both disavowed any knowledge or complicity in the escape. Only from certain closely confidential friends of Willett and the senior Ward have any clues been gained and even these are too wildly fantastic for general credence. The one fact which remains is that up to the present time no trace of the missing madman had been on earth. Charles Ward was an antiquarian from infancy, no doubt gaining his taste from the venerable town around him and from the relics of the past which filled every corner of his parents' old mansion in Prospect Street on the crest of the hill. With the years, his devotion to ancient things increased, so that history, genealogy, and a study of colonial architecture, furniture, and craftsmanship that linked crowded everything else from his sphere of interest. These tastes are important to remember in considering his madness. They do not form its absolute nucleus. They play a prominent part in its superficial form. Gaps of information which the alienists noticed were all related to modern matters, and were invariably offset by a correspondingly excessive, throutwardly concealed knowledge of bygone matters as brought out by etroit questioning, so that one would have fancied the patient literally transferred to a former age through some obscure sort of auto-hypnosis. The odd thing was that Ward seemed no longer interested in antiquities he knew so well. He had, it appears, lost his regard for them through sheer familiarity, and all his final efforts were obviously bent towards mastering those common facts of the modern world which had been so totally and unmistakably expunged from his brain that this wholesale deletion had occurred he did his best to hide but it was clear to all who watched him that his whole program of reading and conversation was determined by a frantic wish to imbib such knowledge of his own life and of the ordinary practical and cultural background of the 20th century as ought to have been his by virtue of his birth in 1902 and his education in the schools of our time. Alienists are now wondering how, in view of his vitally impaired range of data, the escaped patient managed to cope with the complicated world of today, the dominant opinion being that he is lying low in some humble and unexacting position till his stock of modern information can be brought up to the normal. The beginning of Ward's madness is a matter of dispute among alienists. Dr. Lyman, the eminent Boston authority, places it in 1919 or 1920, during the boy's last year at the Moses Brown School, when he suddenly turned from study of the past to study of the occult, and refused to qualify for college on the grounds that he had individual researchers of much greater importance to make. This is certainly born out of Ward's altered habits at the time, especially by his continual search through the town's records among old burying grounds for a certain grave dug in 1771, the grave of an ancestor named Joseph Kerwin, some of whose papers he professed to have found behind the paneling of a very old house in Only Court on Staper's Hill, which Kerwin was known to have built and occupied. It is, broadly speaking, undeniable that the winter of 1919-1920 saw a great change in Ward, whereby he abruptly stopped his general antiquarian pursuits and embarked on a desperate delving into occult subjects, both at home and abroad, varied only by this strangely persistent search for his forefather's grave. From this opinion, however, Dr. Willett substantially dissents, basing his verdict on his close and continuous knowledge of the patient and on certain frightful investigations and discoveries which he made towards the last. Those investigations and discoveries have left their mark upon him, so that his voice trembles when he tells them, and his hand trembles when he tries to write of them. 
Well, it admits that the change in 1919-1920 would ordinarily appear to mark the beginning of a progressive decadence, which accumulated in a horrible and uncanny alienation of 1928, but believes from personal observations that a finer distinction must be made. Granting freely that the boy is always ill-balanced, temperamental, and prone to be unduly susceptible and enthusiastic in his responses to phenomena around him, he refuses to concede that the early alterations mark the actual passage from sanity to madness, crediting instead Ward's own statement that he had discovered or rediscovered something whose effects on human thought was likely to be marvelous and profound, the true madness, he is certain, came with the later chain. After the Kerwin portrait and the ancient papers had been unearthed, after a trip to a strange foreign place had been made, and some terrible innovations chanted under strange and secret circumstances. After certain answers to these invocations had been placed, indicated, and a frantic letter penned under agonizing and inexplicable conditions. After the wave of vampirism and ominous pondue gossip, and after the patient's memory commenced to exclude contemporary images whilst his voice failed and his physical aspect underwent the subtle modification so many subsequently noticed. It was only about this time when it points out with much acuteness that the nightmare qualities became indubitably linked with Ward and the doctor feels shudderingly sure that enough solid evidence exists to sustain the youth's claim regarding his crucial discovery. In the first place the two work of highly intelligent saw Joseph Kerwin's ancient papers found. Secondly, the boy only showed Dr. Willie those papers and a page of Kerwin's diary. And each of the documents had every appearance of geniusness. The hole where Ward claimed to have found them was long a visible reality, and Willett had a very convincing final glimpse of them and surroundings, which can scarcely be believed and can never perhaps be proved. Then there were the mysteries and the coincidences of the Ord and Hutchinson letters, and the problem of the Kerwin penmanship and of what detectives brought to light about Dr. Allen. These things and the terrible message in medieval minuscules found in Willett's pocket when he gained consciousness after his shocking experience. And most conclusive of all, there are the two hideous results which the doctor obtained from a certain pair of formulae during his final investigation. Results which virtually proved the authenticity of the papers and of their monstrous implications at the same time that those papers born forever from human knowledge. Volume 1, Chapter 2 One must look back at Dexter Ward's early life as at something belonging as much to the past as the antiquities he loved so keenly. In the autumn of 1918, and with a considerable show of zest in the military training of the period, he had begun his junior year at the Moses Brown School, which lies very near his home. The old man building, erected in 1819, had always charmed his useful and antiquarian sense, and the spacious park in which the academy is said appealed to his sharp eye for landscape. His social activities were few, and his hours were present mainly at home, in rambling walks, in his classes and drills, and in pursuit of antiquarian and genealogical data, at the city hall, the state house, the public library, the Antheanium, the historical society, the John Carter Brown and John Hay libraries of Brown University, and the newly opened Shepley Library in Benefit Street. One may picture him yet as he was in those days, tall, slim, and blonde, with studious eyes and a slightly stooped, dressed somewhat carelessly, and giving a dominant impression of harmless awkwardness rather than attractiveness. His walks were always adventures in antiquity, during which he managed to recapture from the myriad relics of a glamorous old city a vivid and connected picture of centuries before. His home was a great Georgian mansion atop the well-nigh precipitous hill that rises just east of the river, and from the rear windows of its rambling wings, he could look dizzily out over all the clustered spires, domes, roofs, and landscaper summits, 
of the lower town to the purple hills of the countryside beyond. Here he was born, and from the lovely classic porch of the double-bayed brick facade his nurse had first wheeled him in, in his carriage, past the little white farmhouse of two hundred years before that the town had long ago overtaken, and on toward the stately colleges along the shady, sumptuous street, whose square brick mansions and smaller wooden houses with narrow, heavy columned door porches dream solid and exclusive amidst their generous yards and gardens. He had been wheeled to along sleepy Hogden Street, one tier lower down on the steep hill, and with all its eastern homes on high terraces. The small wooden houses averaged a greater age here, for it was up this hill that the growing town had climbed, and with these rides he had imbibed something of the color of a quaint colonial village. The nurse used to stop and sit on the benches of Prospect Terrence to chat with policemen, and one of the child's first memories was of the great western sea of hazy roofs and domes and steeples and fair hills which he saw one winter afternoon from that great railed embankment all violet and mystic against a fever apocalyptic sunset of reds and golds and purples and curious greens the vast marble dome of the state house stood out in massive silhouette its crowning statue haloed fantastically by a break in one of the tinted straight clouds that barred the flaming sky. When he was larger, his famous walks began, first with his impatiently dragged nurse, and then alone in dreamy meditation. Farther and farther down that almost perpendicular hill he would venture, each time reaching older and quainter levels of an ancient city. He would hesitate gingerly down vertical Jenkins Street, with its bank walls and colonial gables, to the shady Benefit Street corner, where before him was a wooden inky with an ionic pilastered pair of doorways, and beside him a prehistoric gambrel roofer with a bit of primal farmyard remaining in the great judge duffrey house with its fallen vestiges of georgian grandeur it was getting to be a slum here but the titan elms cast a restoring shadow over the place and the boy used to stroll south past the long lines of the pre-revolutionary homes with their great central chimneys and classical portal on the eastern side they were set high over basements with rail double flights of stone steps and the young charles would picture them as they were when the street was new and red heels and periwigs set off the painted pediments whose signs of wear were now becoming so visible Westward, the hill dropped almost as steeply as above, down to the old town street that the founders had laid out at the river's edge in 1636. Here ran innumerable little lanes with leaning, huddled houses of immense antiquity, and fascinated though he was, it was long before he dared to thread their archaic verticality for fear they would turn out a dream or a gateway to unknown terrors. He found it much less formidable to continue along Benefit Street, past the iron fence of St. John's Hidden Churchyard, and the rear of the 1761 Colony House, and the moldering bulk of the Golden Ball Inn, where Washington stopped. At Meeting Street, the successive Gow Lane and the King Street of the other periods, he would look upward to the east and see the arched flight of the steps to which the highway had resorted in climbing the slope, and downward to the west, glimpsing the old brick colonial schoolhouse that smiles across the road at the ancient sign of Shakespeare Head, where the Providence Gazette and Country Journal was printed before the Revolution. Then came the exquisite First Baptist Church of 1775, luxurious with its matchless Gibbs steeple and the Georgian roofs and the cupolas hovering by. Here and to the southward, the neighborhood became better, flowering at last into a marvelous group of earlier mansions. But still, the little ancient lanes led off down the precipice to the west, spectral in their many gabled archaisms and dipping into a riot of iridescent decay where the wicked old waterfronts recalls its proud East Indian days to miss polyglot vice and squalor rotting waves and blear-eyed sheep chandeliers with such surviving alley names as packet bullion gold silver coin doubloon sovereign gilder dollar dime and cent 
Sometimes, as he grew taller and more adventurous, young Ward would venture down into his maelstrom of tottering houses and broken tans rooms, tumbling steps, twisted balustrades, swarthy faces, and nameless odors. Winding from South Main to South Water, searching out the docks where the bay and sound steamers still touch, and returning northward at his lower level past the steep-roofed 1816 warehouse, and the broad square at the Great Bridge, where the 1773 Market House still stands firm on its ancient arches. In that square, he would pause to drink in the bewildering beauty of the old town as it rises on its eastward bluff, decked with its two Georgian spires and crowned by the vast new Christian science dome, as London is crowned by St. Paul's. He liked mostly to reach this point in the late afternoon, when the slanting sun touches the market house, and the ancient house roofs and belfries with gold, and throws magic around the dreaming wharfs where Providence Indian men used to ride at anchor. After a long look, he would grow almost dizzy with the poet's love for the sight, and then he would scale the slope homeward in the dusk past the old white church and up narrow, precipitous ways where yellow gleams would begin to peep out in small paned windows, and through fan lights set high over double flights of steps with curious wrought iron railings. Other times in later years he would seek for vivid contrast, spending half a walk in the crumbling colonial regions northwest of his home, where the hill drops to the lowly eminence of Staper's Hill, with its ghetto and negro quarter clustering round the place where the Boston stagecoast used to start before the revolution, and the other half of the gracious southerly realm about George, Benevolent, Power, and William Streets, where the old slaves hold unchanged the fine estate and bits of walled garden and steep green lane in which so many fragrant memories linger. These ramblings, together with the delinquent studies which accompanied them, certainly amount for the large of the antiquarian lore which at last crowded the modern world from charles ward's mind and illustrate the mental soil upon which fell in that faithful winter of nineteen 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 twenty the seed that came to such strange and terrible fruition Dr. Willett is certain that up to this ill omen winter of first change, Dexter Ward's antiquarianism was free of from every trace of morbid. Graveyards held for him no particular attraction beyond their quaintness and historic value, and of anything like violence or savage instinct he was utterly devoid. Then, by insidious degree, there appeared to develop a curious sequence to one of his genealogical triumphs of the year before, when he had discovered among his material ancestors a certain very long-lived man named Joseph Kuhn, who had come from Salem in March of 1692 and whom a whispered series of highly peculiar and disquieting stories clustered. Ward's great-great-grandfather, Welcome Potter, had, in 1785, married a certain Anne Tillinghast, daughter of Miss Eliza, daughter to Captain James Tillinghast, of whose paternity the had preserved no trace. In late 1918, whilst examining a volume of original town records and manuscript, the young genealogist encountered an entry describing a legal change of name by which, 1772, a Miss Eliza Kerwin, widow of Joseph Kerwin, resumed along with her seven-year-old daughter Anne, her maiden name of Tillinghast on grounds that her husband's name was become a public reproach by reason of what was known after his decease, the witch confirming an ancient common rumor, though not to be credited by loyal wife till proven so is to be wholly passed out. This entry came to light upon the accidental separation of two leaves which had been carefully pasted together and treated as one by a labored revision of the page numbers. It was at once clear to Charles Ward that he had indeed discovered a hitherto unknown great-great-great-grandfather. The discovery doubly excited him because he had already heard vague reports and seen scattered allusions relating to this person, about whom there remained so few publicly available records, aside from those becoming public only in modern time, that it almost seemed as if a conspiracy had existed to blot him from memory. 
What did appear, moreover, was of such a singular and provocative nature that one could not fail to imagine curiously what it was that colonial recorders were so anxious to conceal and forget, or to suspect that the deletion had reasons all too valid. Before this, Ward had been content to let his romanticizing about old Joseph Curran remain in the idle stage, but having discovered the, his own relationship to this apparently hushed-up character, he proceeded to hunt out as systematically as possible whatever he might find concerning him. In this excited quest, he eventually succeeded beyond his highest expectation. For old letters, diaries, and eventually sheaves of unpublished memoirs in cobweb provinces, garnets, and elsewhere yielded many illuminating passages which their writer had not thought it worth their while to destroy. One important sidelight came from a point as remote as New York, where Rhode Island colonial correspondence was stored in the museum at Francis Tavern. The really crucial thing, though, and what, in Dr. Willett's opinion, formed a definite source of Ward's undoing, was the matter found in August 1919 behind the paneling of the crumbling house in Olney Court. It was that, beyond a doubt, which opened up those black vistas whose end was deeper than the pit. Volume 2 An Inequited and a Horror Joseph Cohen, as revealed by the rambling legend embodied by what war had heard and unearthed, was a very astonishing, enigmatic, and obscurely horrible individual. He had fled from Salem to Providence, that universal haven of the odd, the free, and the dissenting, at the beginning of the great witchcraft panic. Being in fear of accusation because of his solitary ways and queer chemical or alchemical experiments, he was a colorless-looking man of about thirty and was soon found qualified to become a freeman of province, thereafter buying a home lot just north of Gregory Dexter's at about the foot of the Olneed Street. His house was built on Stamper's Hill west of Town Street in what later became Olney Court, and in 1761 he replaced this with a larger one on the same site which is still standing. Now the first odd thing about Joseph Curran was that he did not seem to grow much older than he had been on his arrival. He engaged in shipping enterprises, purchased Warfred near Mile and Cove, helped rebuild the Great Bridge in 1713, and in 1723 was one of the founders of the Congregational Church on the Hill. But always did he retain the nondescript aspect of a man, not greatly over 30 or 35. As decades mounted up, this singular quality began to excite wide notice, but Curran always explained it by saying that he came of hardy forefathers and practiced a simplicity of living which did not wear him out. How much simplicity could be reconciled with the inexplicable comings and goings of the secret of merchant? and with the queer gleamings of his windows at all hours of the night, was not very clear to the townsfolk, and they were prone to assign other reasons for his continued youth and longevity. It was held, for the most part, that Curran and Sesson's mixtures and boilings of chemicals had much to do with his condition. Gossip spoke of the strange substances he brought from London and the Indies on ships or purchased in Newport, Boston, and New York. And when the old Dr. Jasmine Bowen came from Rehoboth and opened his apostles, Apothecary shop across the great bridge at the sign of the unicorn and mortar there was ceaseless talk of the drug acids and metals in that taciturn recluse incessantly bought or ordered from him acting on the assumption that curran possessed a wondrous and secret medical skill Many sufferers of various sorts applied to him for aid, but though he appeared to encourage their belief in a non-committal way, and always gave them odd-colored potions in response to their requests, it was observed that his ministrations to others seldom proved of benefit. At length, there were over fifty years had passed since the stranger's advent, and without producing more than five years' apparent change in his face and physique, People began to whisper more darkly, and to meet more than halfway that desire for isolation which he had always shown. Private letters and diaries of the period revealed, too, a multitude of other reasons why Joseph Curran was marveled at, feared, and finally shunned like a plague. 
His passion for graveyards, in which he was glimpsed at all hours and under all conditions, was notorious, though no one had witnessed any deed on his part which could actually be termed ghoulish. On the Paranu Road, he had a farm at which he generally lived during the summer, and to which he would frequently be seen riding at various odd times of the day or night. Here his only visible servants, farmers, and caretakers were all solemn paired of aged, not regressed Indians. The husband dumb and curiously scarred, and the wife of a very repulsive cast of continents, probably due to a mixture of negro blood. In the lean-to of this house was a laboratory where most of the chemical experiments were conducted. Curious porters and teamers who delivered bottles, bags, or boxes at the small rear door would exchange accounts of the fantastic flat crucibles and the alemic and furnaces they saw in the low-shelved room, and prophesied in whispers that the closed-mouthed chemists, by which they meant alchemists, would not be long in finding the philosopher's stone. The nearest neighborhoods to this farm, the Fenners, a quarter mile away, had still queerer things to tell of certain sounds which they insisted came from Curran's place in the night. There were cries, they said, and sustained howling, and they did not like the large number of livestock which thronged the pastures, for no such amount was needed to keep a lone old man and very few servants in meat, milk, and wool. The identity of the stock seemed to change from week to week as new droves were purchased from the Kingstown farmer. Then, too, there was something very obnoxious about that certain great stone outbuilding, which only high, narrow slits for windows. Great Bridge idlers likewise had much to say of, of Curran's townhouse in Alney Court. Not so much the fine new one built in 1761, when the man must have been nearly a century old, but the first low, gramble-roofed one, with the windowless attic and the shingled sides, whose timbers he took the particular precaution of burning after its demolition. Here there was less mystery, it is true. But the hours at which lights were seen, the secretiveness of the two swarthy foreigners who compromised the only men servants, the hideous, indistinct mumbling of the incredibly aged French housekeeper, the large amounts of food seen to enter a door within which only four persons lived, and the quality of certain voices often heard in a muffled conversation at highly unseasonable times, all combined with what was known of the Parway farm to give the place a bad name in choicer circles, in choosier circles, too. The current home was by no means undiscussed, for as the newcomer had gradually worked into the church and trading life of the town, he had naturally made acquaintances of a better sort. His company and conversation he was well fitted by education to enjoy. His birth was known to be good since the Kerwins and Corwins of Salem needed no introduction in New England. It developed that Joseph Cohen had traveled much in early life, living for a time in England and making at least two voyages to the Orient. And his speech, when denying to use it, was that of a learned and cultivated Englishman. But for some reason or another, Curran did not care for society. Whilst never actually rebuffing a visitor, he always reared such a wall of reserve that few could think of anything to say to him which would not sound a name. There seemed to lurk in his bearing some cryptic, sardonic arrogance, as if he had come to find all human beings dull through having moved among strangers and more potent entities. When Dr. Checkley, the famous wit, came from Boston in 1738 to be rector of King's Church, he did not neglect calling on one of whom he soon heard so much, but left in a very short while because of some sinister undercurrent he detected in his host's discourse. Charles Ward told his father, when they discussed Curran one winter evening, that he would give him much to learn what the mysterious old man had said to the sprightly clerk, but that all diarists agree concerning Dr. Checkley's reluctance to repeat anything he had heard. The good man had been hideously shocked and could never recall Joseph Curran without a visible loss of a gay urbanity for which he was famed. 
Most definite, however, was the reason why another man of taste and breeding avoided the haughty hermit. In 1746, Mr. John Moret, an elderly English gentleman of literary and scientific leanings, came from Newport to the town, was so rapidly overtaking it in standing, and built a fine country seat on the neck in what is now the heart of the best residence section. He lived in considerable style and comfort keeping the first coach and livelier servants in town, and taking great pride in his telescope, his microscope, and his well-chosen library of English and Latin books. Hearing of Cullen as the owner of the best library in Providence, Dr. Marriott early paid him a call, and was more cordially received than most other callers at the house had been. His admiration for his host's ample shelves, which beside the Greek, Latin, and English classics were equipped with a remarkable battery of philosophical, mathematical, and scientific works, including Paralaskius, Aricola, Van Helmont, Silvest, Gabro, Boyle, Boyerhav, Berker, and Stahl, led current to suggest a visit to the farmhouse and laboratory, whither he had never invited anyone before, and the two drove out at once in Mr. Marriott's coach. Mr. Marriott always confessed to seeing nothing really horrible at the farmhouse, but maintained that the titles of the book in the special library of thaumaturgical, alchemical, and theological subjects, which Curran kept in a front room, were alone sufficient to inspire him with a lasting loathing. Perhaps, however, the facial expression of the owner in exhibiting them contributed much of the prejudice. The bizarre collection, besides a host of standard works which Mr. Marriott was not too alarmed to envy, embraced nearly all of the Kabbalists and demonologists and magicians known to me, and was a treasure house of lore in a doubtful realms of alchemy and astrology. Hermes Trimedicus in Marsnard's edition, the Turba Philosophy, Gerber's Lith Investigations, and Artifice's Key of Wisdom all were there. With the Kabbalist's Dohar, Peter Jami's set of Albertus Magnus, Raymond Lully's Ars Magna et Ultum in Zenter's edition. Edition. Roger Bacon's Thesaurus Camus, Fudd's Clavus Alchemy, and Trithermus de Lapid Philosophico, crowding them close. Medieval Jews and Arabs were represented in profusion, and Mr. Marriott turned pale when, upon taking down a fine volume conspicuously labeled as the Quanun on Islam, he found it was in truth the forbidden Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul Azir, of which he had heard such monstrous things whispered some years previously after the exposure of nameless rites at the strange little fishing village of Kingsport in the province of Massachusetts Bay. But oddly enough, the worthy gentleman owed himself impalpably, disquieted by the mere minor detail. On a huge mahogany table there lay face downward a badly worn copy of Borlas, bearing many cryptical marginali and interlineations in Curran's hand. The book was open at about its middle, and one paragraph displayed such thick and tremendous pen strokes beneath the lines of the mystic black letter that the visitor could not resist scanning it through. Whether it was the nature of the passage underscored, or the feverish heaviness of the strokes which formed the underscore, he could not tell. But something in that combination affected him very badly and very peculiar. He recalled it to the end of his days, writing it down from memory in his diary and once trying to recite it to his close friend Dr. Checkley until he saw a greatly disturbed near a Bain director. It read, The essential salts of animals may be so prepared and preserved that an ingenious man may have the whole Ark of Noah in his own study, and raise the fine shape of an animal out of its ashes at his pleasure. And by the like method, from the essential salts of humane dust, a philosopher may, without any criminal necromancy, call up the shape of any dead ancestor from the dust whereinto his body has been incinerated. It was near the docks along the southerly part of the town street, however, that the worst things were muttered about Joseph Curran. Sailors are superstitious folk, and the seasoned salt who man the infinite rum slave and molasses slopes, the rakish privateers, and the great brigs of the browns, 
Crawfords and Tilling Hass all made strange furtive signs of protection when they saw the slim, deceptively young-looking figure with its yellow hair and, and slight stoop entering the Curran warehouse in Dubloon Street or talking with captains and supercargo on the long quay where the Curran ship rode restlessly. Curran's own clerks and captains hated and feared it, and all the sailors were mongrel riffraffs from Martin K. from St. Eustace Havana, or Port Royal at that. It was, in a way, the frequency with which these sailors were replaced with inspired the acutest and most tangible part of the fear in which the old man was held. A crew would be turned loose in the town on the shore leave, some of its members perhaps charged with his errand or that, and when reassembled, it would be almost sure to lack one or more men. That many of the errands had concerned the farm on the Partway Road, and that few of the sailors ever been seen to return from that place was not forgotten, so that in time it became exceedingly difficult for Curran to keep his oddly assorted hand. Almost invariably, several would desert soon after hearing the gossip of the Providence Wharves, and their replacement in the West Indies became an increasingly great problem to the merchants. In 1760, Joseph Curran was virtually an outcast, suspected of vague horrors and Damionic alliances, which all seemed the more menacing because they could not be named, understood, or even proved to exist. The last straw may have come from the affair of the missing soldiers in 1758, for in March and April of that year, two royal regiments on their way to New France were quartered in Providence and depleted by an inexplicable process far beyond the average rate of, of desertion. Rumor dwelt on the frequency with which Curran was wont to be seen talking to a red-coated stranger, and as several of them began to be missing, people thought of it the odd conditions among his own seamen. What would have happened if the regiments had not been ordered on? No one can tell. Meanwhile, the merchant's worldly affairs were prospering. He had a virtual monopoly of the town's trade in salt cheddar, black pepper, cinnamon, and easily led any other shipping establishment save the browns in his importation of brass wire, indigo, cotton, woolen, salt, rigging, iron, paper, and English goods of every kind. Such shopkeepers such as James Green at the sign of the elephant in Cheapside, the Russells at the sign of the Golden Eagle across the bridge, or Clark and Nightingale at the frying pan and fish near the new coffee ground, depended almost wholly upon him for their stock and his arrangements with the local distillers, the Nargetsian dairymen and horse breeders and the Newport candle makers made him one of the prime exporters of the colony. Ostracized though he was, he did not lack or civic spirit of any sort. When the colony house was burned, he subscribed handsomely to the lotteries, which the new brick one still stands at the head of a parade in the old main street, was built in 1761. In that same year, too, he helped rebuild the Great Bridge after the October Gale. He replaced many of the books in the public library consumed in the colony house fire, and bought heavily in the lottery that gave the money market parade and deep rutted town street their pavement of great round stones with the brick foot or cosy in the middle. About this time also he built the plain but ex excellent new house whose doorway is still such a triumph of carving. When the Whitefield at Heron broke off from Dr. Cotton's Hill Church in 1743 and founded Deacon Snow's church across the bridge, Irwin had gone with them, though his cell and attendance soon abated. Now, however, he cultivated piety once more, as if to dispel the shadow which had thrown him into isolation and would soon begin to wreck his business fortune, if not sharply checked.